In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, okay, let's go straight to the point. The wound we are born with. This is the theme, the topic of today's talk. And because it is very important, I think it's really essential for our spiritual life, if you can actually divide life to spiritual and unspiritual. Generally, it's so important for our life uh, that I want us to focus on, uh, um, on the very wound we will talk about and to use our time best we can. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay, why it is so important? First of all, because we want to have a good relationship with Jesus, don't we? I mean, we are all here because of that, because we care for Jesus. We want to have the strongest, the closest possible relationship with him. Am I right? Uh, and secondly, we want to have a good relationship with ourselves. I mean, I want to know myself. And so many times I'm a mystery to myself. I do not understand my actions, my choices so often contradict to what I choose as the fundament of my life, what my faith tells me and what I believe in. So why? We will search for the answers and for the clues to these questions, these mysteries. And... Uh, I want to tell you what, in this talk that the key to understand uh, these two issues, so the relationship with Jesus and knowing myself, so relationship with myself, is in one word, and it is distrust. Sounds strange, maybe. That's good. You should feel intrigued. And... Uh, follow me in my process of getting to the answer, why it is so important. And to understand it, we need to go to the book of Genesis, to chapter 3, because this is where everything begins. There, in this uh, chapter, the beginning of the Holy Scripture of the Bible, we will find the description, symbolic description, don't take it too literally, you know, like apples, trees, and everything. But symbolic description of the fall of Adam and Eve, which many years ago, many centuries later, influences us, the people of the 21st century. The sin of our first parents, it's amazing. Generally, the consequences of every sin are long-lasting. Okay, let's open the book of Genesis. The beginning of chapter 3 uh, starts with these words. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord has made. The serpent, devil, Satan, evil spirit, demon, we don't talk much about him, don't we? And we don't think much about him. On one hand, it's, it's very good because he's totally not interesting. He's so ugly. And actually, I could use like many strong words now to describe how bad, ugly, and un uninteresting he is. It's so good that I don't know these words, so I'm not tempted to use them now. But, I mean, we should think and realize uh, that he really is, that he's there, that he's acting, that he's not a fairy tale, that he's not um, a creature from a fairy tale with horns and a tail. He is a spiritual power actually influencing our lives every day. the serpent. Let's look at his uh, strategy as it repeats again and again. I told you already, he's totally not interesting. That means he's not creative. He repeats himself. And that's good for us because when you see his strategy in your life, how he's tempting you, 
you can be sure that he will repeat the same strategy in a while. So uh, it's important to leave uh, reflecting on if you commit sins, especially if there are some sins which repeat in your life, just spend some time on, you know, kind of seeing step by step, how did it happen that I did it again? Figure out his strategy, the strategy of temptation. And don't ever underestimate him, because as the scripture says, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he's definitely more intelligent than we are. So keep watch. The serpent said to woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See uh, how gentle, how subtle the snake is, how engaged, involved he seems to be, interested with what's happening to you, you know, he, he comes to you, he speaks to you, he uh, questions you, he's kind of concerned about you. And we like when someone is interested with us. Then we stop keeping watch, no matter who the person is. It can be devil in disguise, but he's interested with me, so keep watch. So, Satan is a great actor. We need to remember this. Uh, he comes and whispers in your ear, oh, poor thing, when you need to hear these words. And in another situation, when you feel hurt, he will provoke you to rebellion, like confirming what your wounded nature feels, your wounded feelings uh, tell you, you know, he will follow the same voice saying, that's not right, it's, it's unjust, uh, I cannot accept this. He always seems to be a good friend. But again, keep watch, he's just a good actor. So the cure to all temptations, I mean in every situation, believe me, there's one cure that will always work, and it is the truth. Eve could win the fight at that stage of temptation if she would simply tell the truth. No, that's not what God said. Or if she would ignore the snake, like totally paying no attention to what he says, what he whispers. And this is actually what Jesus uh, taught Faustina, how she should behave in any temptation. Don't even enter the dialogue with the tempter. Don't enter the dialogue. Just cut the temptation at the very first moment. Again, be reminded the serpent is more crafty. He's more sneaky, more artful than we are. Truth is the cure to every temptation. Unfortunately, Eve did not use this advice, so she didn't tell the truth. She followed the lie. That's usually how it goes. Lie follows lie, and again, the next lie, and you just cannot stop this. So Eve didn't say the truth, and she entered the dialogue, two mistakes. She said that God said, you must not eat fruit from the tree that, it is, that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. Interesting idea, but that's a lie. That's not what God said. The exact words of God are, and, and just listen, how beautiful comparing to what the snake said just a minute ago. God says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. How generous is he? 
also is important to notice he created the garden for the first people. The garden, not the desert. Garden full of all the beauties and riches and everything that's exciting. And he says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. There's just one tree, he says, don't eat from it. And he explains why. Good God, good Father. So this is where Eve's problem began. And she entered the dialogue with the tempter. She followed his lie with another lie. And this is also where, where our problem began. Satan, by his lie, planted the seed of doubt, the seed of distrust in her heart. She started to look at the good God, at the generous creator, with different look, suspicious look. He poisoned, Satan poisoned her, I would say, virginal look, you know, the first look, like the look of the virgin, of the, of the young girl who sees love with her pure eyes. Satan injected poison in these eyes and she stopped seeing the good God, the generous creator. She started being suspicious. And we are all children of Adam and Eve. We inherited that suspicious look. And now when our good God, our generous creator, gives us, for example, 10 commandments. We see, what do we see? 10 prohibitions, 10 times no. It's as if we would see, you know, the powerful God, but surely not the good father whom we are longing to meet, but like the overprotective father who's standing between you and something good, something desirable, and saying, don't even think about it. That's what happened. That's how the, the poison of Satan spoiled our pure look, our gaze at God, our seeing the truth about him. If our image of God wouldn't be affected with the consequences of the original sin, we would see that Ten Commandments, let's stay with this example, but we can speak about all the words of God, but let's stay with the Ten Commandments. Uh, we would see them as a gift, as a, a way of safeguarding us, we would rather see ourselves as so precious to God that he won't allow anyone to harm us and even he won't allow us to harm ourselves. Or maybe we would see ourselves as blind men and we would be so grateful that there is someone who sees next to us saying, no, 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 don't, don't turn to the left because there is a hole in the sidewalk. Oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me this. I, I just can't see. And brothers and sisters, we are all blind men in this world. We really, really don't understand and don't see uh, many things. What we see is really a, a tiny, tiny um, part of not only our whole life's story, but the history of the world we do not have the same perspective as God does. We might see something which seems to be good, tasty, delicious, desirable, but he sees already the consequences of you eating that cake. 
Just listen to the voice of the good father, not over overprotected protective father. Or as Satan tries to persuade us that he's just afraid of us, that we can, if we will get the knowledge that he has, he will be threatened by our knowledge. Come on, it, it, you hear me saying this and you know it's nonsense. So we, we've lost this trustful, childlike look at the father. That's the consequence consequence of the original sin. And Jesus came into the world. He became one of us. He humbled himself so deeply. And then he allowed himself to be tortured and killed just to give us the highest possible, the strongest possible proof of who God really is. Like St. Faustina says, his love and mercy itself, incarnated love and mercy. When you look at Jesus, there's nothing else in him. There's no fear of you or your possibilities. You are not a threat to him. He's so happy when you flourish, when you grow, when you eat from all the trees of the garden. Expect, except one, because this one won't do you good. So even though Jesus gave us the highest possible expression of God's love for us, we still have doubts. It's unbelievable how deep is the wound of distrust that we all carry in our hearts. That though we have crucifixes all over, I carry the crucifix on my heart and I can touch it and remind myself about the love of God like in every second of my life and still I also have doubts. Jesus' greatest pain is that we distrust him. He said these powerful words to St. Faustina. Distrust on the part of soul is tearing at my insides. Just, just imagine that your in, insides are torn apart, that the pain of Maybe just imagine the person you love the most in your life. Just think about, I don't know, maybe it's, it's your mother, father, your friend, your brother, sister. Just think about the person whom you love the most. And right now you could tell me with honesty, I'm ready to give my life for him or for her. I would defend him with my own body if there would be a need to do so. I love him so much. And then in a, a minute later, you find out that this person has secrets before you, that he is not willing to share with you everything, that he doesn't trust you, that he won't ask you and he won't tell you about his worries, his pains, or he will lie to you because he's afraid of your reaction. Or no matter how many good advices you would give to, let's say, your younger brother, he will still listen to his friends, not to you, because he trusts his, his friends more than he trusts you. You who are ready to give your life for him. Just imagine the pain. Jesus says, despite my inexhaustible love for them, they do not trust me. Even my death is not enough for them. Jesus asks, what else could I do for you? What other proofs of my love do you need?
I told you at the beginning that the theme of this evening, so the wound we are born with, the wound of distrust, is so very important uh, to, to understand or to build a good relationship with Jesus because we need to face the first uh, fundamental obstacle in this area of building a good relationship with him, the wound of distrust. Distrust destroys every relationship. But distrust towards God is like deadly. It destroys everything. And I believe that's why the major calling of Jesus that he directs towards us through Saint Faustina is trust me. Just Trust me. Going back to the book of Genesis. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The snake persuades Eve to do something against God's will. And he gives her a vision of happiness when she will do what she wants, will, what she's drawn to do, is follow it, do it. Your happiness is in doing it your way, not his way, do it your way. So often in modern culture, we hear uh, the saying, follow your heart. And we feel that this is something good, you know, following my heart seems to be a very good idea. Because heart is always connected with what's best, with love. You know, being already in, in kindergarten, in preschool, uh, they teach you that if you want to speak about love, if you want to express your love to your mother, to your father, just draw a heart. So since being an infant almost, we are being taught heart is the best. Following my heart seems to be the best option. And again, healing comes through the scripture, through the Holy Bible. The prophet Jeremiah says that heart is deceitful. Deceitful. Don't follow your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. There's nothing more deceitful than your heart. Don't follow your heart. Follow the word of the Lord. Follow what he says, not the rhythm of your heart, because as soon as you ac accept that your heart is wounded, you will have no doubts. Um, it's, it's not a wise decision to follow my heart, because there is wound in it. And when I follow my heart, that means I follow the wound. Follow the word of God. Follow, follow what he says. So false image of happiness, my way. The true image of happiness, his way. Jesus, I trust in you. I will achieve, achieve happiness by doing what he wants me to do. And just, just recall, let me recall you a few examples of happy people. Jesus is happy. And what's the, what he says is, Father, may your will be done, not mine. He's the happy person, the first happy person ever walking on earth. Mary is happy. And what, what is that she's saying? She says, be done unto me according to thy word. So again, your way, not my way. Sister Faustina is happy. 
By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this to you already, that the very meaning of her name is happy. Faustina means happy. So, and what is she saying? What, what is the, the, the rhythm of, of her life? She, she keeps on repeating with her life, with her choices. Jesus, I trust in you. And again, not my way, your way. I trust in you, not in me. No, no, no. I have serious doubts in myself in following what comes to my head. I follow you. John Paul II is happy. And what he says, totus tuus, totally yours. I'm totally yours. I put my life into your hands and do with it, with it whatever you want. And that's the best for me. I'm happy when I do what you want. The will of God is our happiness, brothers and sisters. And we will keep on repeating this again and again. We need to have it engraved in our hearts. This is trust, following God's will. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. This will be the rhythm of uh, all our evenings with Merciful Jesus, but especially the next few months. Uh, and let me share with you another quote of St. John Paul II, which is like one of the best quotes ever and definitely one of my favorite. And I was convinced that no matter what will I say to you this evening, I definitely need to share with you this quote. So St. John Paul II, um, while encouraging us to trust Jesus, uh, he says, to trust Jesus means to believe everything what he says, no matter how very strange that would seem to be. And to reject the suggestions of the evil, no matter how very reasonable they would seem to be. Again, if I want to trust Jesus, I will follow whatever he says, no matter how strange it may sound to me or to the other people. And if I trust Jesus, I won't follow the suggestions of the evil one, no matter how reasonable they will seem to be. According to my vision of the world or the the vision of the world that's very popular nowadays. Something that you hear in media, in social media, you will see many things that the same voice, it's kind of repetitive. But it's not necessarily the voice of the Lord. We need to go back again and again to the Holy Scripture and to read the Bible, to actually have the ability to, to discern which voice comes from the God and which, go, which voice comes from the evil one. Following the, the book of Genesis, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Look, she saw that the fruit is good and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. She saw all the good things in that apple, that forbidden fruit. If would never chose this apple, she would never ate it if she would see its poisonous. Even when we sin, brothers and sisters, we choose good. I mean, we are, we are created by God. We are his children. So uh, even we carry the, this deep wound in our hearts, we are still made in his image and likeness. And we won't choose evil. Like we have to be like really, really, totally ruined as human beings, like really immersed in darkness to like consciously choose evil. 
No, we choose good. We choose something that seems to be good for us. It doesn't have to be good, but it seems to be good for us. We follow the advertisement simply. Going back to the book of Genesis. She also gave some to her husband, some, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Hmm. Interesting. Satan promised them that when they will eat this fruit, they will be like God. So they ate the fruit. Look at how advertisement works. He promises, you will be like God. Okay, so let's eat the apple. They did it, and then they realized they were naked. And in that very moment, you could hear the laugh of, of the evil spirit, Satan's laugh, laughter. I made it again. I cheated them. I played, uh, I fooled them, I deceived them, I made it. He's so happy when he can play tricks on us and when we follow his advertisement and then he uncovers uh, everything, he shows us the truth so that to torment us, to see us in pain, he really enjoys it. Again, that should be for us an encouragement to study the strategies of the evil spirit. Don't let him fool you again and again. Maybe that will be encouragement for you to do the exam of conscience, like every day in the evening, and to see if there are some mistakes I make on a daily basis, maybe on a weekly basis, or like they are re repeated in my life. Just see how it works, how the mechanism of this uh, sin or mistake works in your life. Just work it out with the help of the Lord. Just take it uh, on a meeting with him, on your prayer. Talk about this with Jesus and, and don't be fooled again. Don't let yourself be fooled again by the Satan's tricks he's playing on you. We have this wound, this inclination towards evil. That's the consequence of the original sin. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, when man looks into his own heart, he finds that he is drawn towards what is wrong. That's just the way it is. It, we are not to fight with it. We are not to discuss with this. We are to accept it and to learn to fight even being wounded. We still have the strength to fight with the tempter. Saint Faustina says, oh, how everything drags man towards the earth. My Jesus, despite your graces, I see and feel all my misery. I begin my day with a battle and end it with a battle. As soon as I conquer one obstacle, ten more appear to take its place. Constant fighting. That's our life on earth. Just don't be deluded that life is to rest. No, not life is to fight. Saint Paul says, I do not I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Again, consequence of the original sin. Accept it, be aware of it, accept it, live with it, fight with the wound in your heart, in the army of the victor of Jesus Christ. And don't be afraid. You will win the battle because you are with him. He is with you. 
don't be afraid, don't be afraid. That's another um, repeated phrase or like fundamental phrase that we should be reminded of again and again. Jesus, I trust in you, don't be afraid. Um, fear is, um, is the first fruit of sin. Adam and Eve, they were not afraid of anything as long as they haven't committed the sin. As soon as they did, fear entered their lives. And so it is the same in our own personal histories. And fear is like a leash by which Satan is holding us. You know, that's, that's his tool, fear. We are afraid, first of all, of death. We are afraid of dying. Not only of the final moment of our lives when we will, like, like our body will die, but we are afraid of everyday dying. We are afraid of sacrifices, of suffering. Uh, and that's also normal. Yeah, just be aware, it's, it's natural. That comes from your wounded nature, this fear. And again, the healing is in Jesus Christ who teaches us, who tells us, who gives us a promise of eternal life. And as soon as we accept it, we are not afraid anymore because we know that our soul is immortal and no one can actually kill us. They can only kill our body, but also our body will resurrect. So we shouldn't be afraid even of that. He is our hope and our strength and our promise. He is our eternity. Fear is like a leash by which Satan is holding us. But Jesus frees us from all fears. He's our savior. Dear brothers and sisters, yes, we entered the, the area of trust by speaking firstly uh, about the problems with trust we have. So the natural inclination to distrust. Um, there will be continuation. Every next talk during the next few months will uncover another dimension, another uh, expression of trust. We will learn what does it mean to trust, how to trust Jesus. Um, we will follow the footsteps of Faustina and John Paul II. And uh, I'm sure we will move forward, you know, that we will become stronger, that these uh, prayers we have here at the shrine, that the, the talks and then the sharing we have afterwards, it will all make us stronger to fight, not to be fooled again and again and again, uh, and not to be discouraged if it happens again. Uh, just to let him lift you up again, just to let Jesus uh, lift you up, give you hope, and uh, remember, our happiness is his will, his ways, not mine. Jesus, I trust in you. Thank you.